Hello, everyone. My name is Priyanka Sen. I'm one of the new staff members here at Texas Heart Institute. I work in the divisions of clinical and interventional cardiology, as well as advanced heart failure and transplant. And today I'd like to give you a talk about extracorporeal life support, uh, specifically discussing uh, VA ECMO support. So to start off with regarding the epidemiology of cardiogenic shock, um, well, there's the hallmarks of the syndrome itself, and that includes acute myocardial contractile dysfunction with resultant hypoperfusion. There are various definitions that might have different blood pressure cutoffs or MAP cutoffs, um, depending on the paper that you look at. But typically they say if the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 uh, for greater than 30 minutes in somebody who normally does not live with that blood pressure, uh, or you are requiring the use of inotropes or vasoconstrictors to maintain that blood pressure, in addition to the evidence of end organ hypoperfusion. Because cardiogenic shock as a syndrome is not just the heart not functioning well as a, as a pump, but also what are the downstream effects of that. So things like an elevated lactate might support that diagnosis. Uh, it is still, despite uh, years and years of this diagnosis having been in existence, still associated, unfortunately, with significant morbidity and mortality, uh, approaching anywhere from 25 to 50 percent um, in a uh, majority of those cases, but can be even more depending on how um, recalcitrant the disease ends up being to medical management. And above all else, it is a very time sensitive diagnosis. Uh, the idea being that if any intervention is to be done, it has to be done before this becomes, before this goes from a cardiac to a cardiometabolic process, at which point all the damage is kind of done. Now, looking at the causes of cardiogenic shock, the vast majority are still related to ACS, which is in that purplish color in the pie chart. Um, this is followed by acute on chronic heart failure um, on down the list. Now, SKY is one of the um, interventional cardiology organizations in America, and they, about two to three years ago, they came up with this kind of structure, a hierarchy about thinking uh, how to risk stratify a patient whom you see um, in the hospital. And it was defined by five stages, stage A through E, A starting as those people who are at risk. Um, those are people who, for instance, have had a heart attack in the past, uh, prior infarction, acute or chronic, uh, or acute on chronic heart failure, those being the risk factors for development of cardiogenic shock in future. B stands for beginning, and that's people who have clinical evidence of relative hypotension, so those patients who might be just starting to have blood pressures less than 90, or tachycardia without hypoperfusion. Sometimes the earliest things that we can see clinically is a diminished pulse pressure and tachycardia to go along with it before the patient begins to feel uh, cold and clammy. C is classic. These are the patients who, without a doubt, are in cardiogenic shock. Um, they are hypoperfused, however, they are not yet um, to a point that they cannot be revived. These are people who might still be going through some resuscitation, resuscitative process, whether they're on inotropes or they've already started to be on mechanical circulatory support. This already includes those people who could be on ECMO but are not deteriorating on it, and that defines stage D. There are, of course, fallacies, in, in my opinion, with this um, this way of classifying patients, because it also, the, the distinction between C and D also has to do with, did you provide enough support to begin with? A D is of course, if they're deteriorating on the support that's been provided and E is extremis. So that is the crashing and burning patient of Intermax one. And of course, as would be expected, the sicker somebody is, the higher the stage they're in, the higher likelihood of mortality or bad outcomes. Cardiogenic shock, again, becomes an inflammatory process. It elicits an inflammatory cascade, which initially is supposed to be compensatory, but eventually these compensatory mechanisms actually lead to more harm, leading to more things like ischemia, more myocardial work, and uh, just leading to progressive myocardial dysfunction. Um, many inflammatory markers can be elevated. These are a lot of things that are currently being studied right now to see if they can function as prognostic markers in future, but those are still uh, kind of in the works of, um, of papers. 
And again, once the cardiometabolic process has started, here we're just focusing on lactates. And this is one paper that looked at that. Uh, they marked a cutoff value of 3.1 of lactate. And especially if it persisted even eight hours after presentation, the risk of mortality was substantially more. So just another example that after you've let the pump fail and it has already exhibited its, um, its consequences on the rest of the body, hereby with elevation of the lactate, which is a marker of anaerobic respiration, it just shows that the spiral has started and is uh, not patient is not doing well. Again, how do we solve the hemodynamic support um, equation? If we look at it that way, there are three approaches to it, and it's a team effort that involves cardiologists, sometimes surgeons, and definitely perfusionists. Um, it's a three-pronged approach, both to increase the circulatory support, second is provide ventricular support, and three is to provide a timely coronary perfusion because ultimately time is muscle and we need to revascularize as soon as possible if that was the inciting factor. In terms of providing circulatory support, our goal is to increase the mean arterial pressure because that ultimately is going to what is going to help us perfuse the rest of the vital organs. And again, clinically at bedside, we can assess that with increases in urine output or improvements in mentation, if that was a problem before, and certainly by markers um, like serum lactate. Um, the urine is another good marker, of course, because 20% of the cardiac output is supplied to the kidneys. So it becomes a quick measure of how the body overall is doing. And ultimately, we also want to reduce the intercardiac uh, filling pressure, such as the LV, EDP, and the wedge. Initially, when somebody comes in shock, um, I don't think most people would be jumping towards mechanical circulatory support. We like to use and to some extent exhaust some of the uh, medical management first, but there are limitations with that. Um, as would be expected, the more number of pressors, vasoconstrictors, or inotropes that are being used, that not only marks the fact that a patient is needing more support and therefore are sicker and therefore are more likely to have bad, out bad outcomes, but the chemicals that we are using to artificially improve the uh, perfusion or the blood pressure have harmful effects on the heart. And uh, that can not only increase arrhythmias, especially if you're using beta agonistic medications, um, but also the severe vasoconstriction peripherally uh, can lead to all the uh, ischemic digits and just worsening of your lactate, um, rhabdomyolysis, all of these problems, which only make it harder for the heart. An analogy that I've often heard is it's like flogging an old horse, um, flogging with all of these chemicals uh, in this situation. So the goals of using acute percutaneous MCS then uh, is to target these following things. One is to decrease the uh, left uh, ventricular end diastolic filling pressures. Um, that will also help in turn relieve some of the congestion that's occurring behind the left side of the heart, which is the lungs. We want to augment cardiac output, so improve forward flow. We want to decrease reliance on vasoconstrictors on, and inotropes. So sometimes by providing a timely percutaneous MCS device, we can actually start coming down on some of the very astronomically high doses of pressors, uh, which have their own harmful effects. And ultimately, all of this is to increase organ perfusion, especially to the kidneys and the brain. The ideal MCS, of course, um, you know, there, there are many uh, choices when we uh, see a patient, and I don't think there's ne necessarily one perfect one. It really depends on the situation. Something as simple as a balloon pump might be just what somebody needs for a severe MR, which is mitral regurgitation, but somebody with full-blown myocarditis might need something much more aggressive for biventricular support like a VA ECMO. So it really depends on the clinical situation, but before embarking on implanting any of these devices, we should always consider that this should be a bridge to either recovery or a bridge to a decision hopefully something that will lead to either um, a uh, uh, completely uh, either a heart transplant or a durable uh, mechanical circulatory support device, such as an LVAD. So important considerations when we're choosing MCS, of course, vascular access matters uh, because um, 
these devices are going into the arterial system, the artery size matters because it must be able to accommodate the cannulas that we will be putting in. And that also will affect whether we have any kind of ischemic problems distal to where we've placed the cannula. Patient selection matters foremost. There are also hemocompatibility issues that need to be taken into account, um, many of which have improved over time because the materials being used in the cannulas are probably not as thrombogenic as they once used to be. But regardless, because there is that interaction and because in some of these pumps, the blood is being taken extracorporeally or outside of the body, it becomes very important for us to keep such patients on anticoagulation at all times. And then, of course, looking at the hemodynamics and the pump position matters too once it's in, whether it's balloon pump, whether it's ECMO, whether it's tandem or impella, uh, imaging can be very vital in uh, our daily sort of uh, assessment of the patient to determine that at least our uh, positioning of the device is optimal. So when it comes down to it of our percutaneous MCS options, there are a few that I'd like to mention, but really our focus is going to be on VA ECMO. The ones that we use at this hospital is the balloon pump, intra-aortic balloon pump, which uses a counter pulsation method to essentially decrease the afterload and also improve coronary perfusion. And uh, of the and that's a pulsatile pump where basically it inflates in diastole and then uh, decompresses in systole. Of our continuous pumps, we've got the axial flow pumps, which Impella CP is the one that we're using in the medical center here. And basically by saying that it's axial flow means that the blood that is being moved through the pump is in the same direction of flow as the native blood. Um, and then centrifugal pump is uh, the extracorporeal ones the tandem heart, as well as the VA ECMO, extracorporeal meaning that the blood is taken out of the body goes to a pump that sits out of the body. And when we compare intracorporeal pumps to extracorporeal pumps, which I know you all are probably much more expert in this, is that um, an extracorporeal pump, because it's sitting out of the body, it can be a bigger pump and that allows it to spin much faster to achieve the same flow that a VA ECMO might be able to achieve versus an Impella CP, which is sitting in the body, the Impella CP has to spin significantly faster. And therefore, it would be more prone if we're trying to achieve the same flow for more hemolysis than would a bigger pump that's sitting outside of the body. And what's also important in making the decision is what is the level of circulatory support that each of these devices can uh, provide. A uh, balloon pump and at least the 2.5, 2 even the CP, they do not provide necessarily full support. CP can take you to about three, three, five or so, um, but definitely much more flow can be achieved with a VA ECMO or tandem. And Impella 5O is also another option, but here I think we'll stick to those that are uh, purely percutaneous because 5O requires the help of a surgeon to place an axillary graft. So now going again into this, this is an example of some of the things that would go into place if somebody were to use a shock protocol or the decision making. Once, of course, the diagnosis of cardiogenic shock has been achieved uh, or made, uh, then you try with medications to uh, improve the hemodynamics. And you're looking for things like evidence of SIRS, the pulmonary congestion, that spiral of things that ultimately can lead to death has already started. So at the intervenable portion, once you've assessed the hemodynamics, if you have a little bit of luxury of time, a right heart cath definitely goes a long way. Sometimes, unfortunately, especially in emergent situations of somebody's crash before you, you might not have that, um, that time to be able to do it. But if you're able to do a right and left heart cath, it really helps determine whether you're dealing with a univentricular process um, versus a biventricular process, which might need more than, let's say, a balloon or an impella. And so in that, there are various hemodynamic mon uh, kind of parameters that we can use, such as PAPI, such as CPI, um, but essentially all to help us determine whether we need more support to provide for both ventricles or just one. MCS has been evaluated in many cardiogenic shock trials over the years, starting from 2012, actually even before that, um, initially with balloon pump, then gradually tandem heart uh, came up in uh, 
later on. And then in the impressed shock trial, Impella was evaluated. But you can see regardless of the trial, the uh, mortality has been quite significant and shocking, um, even despite the advent of more progressive kind of machines. And so we're ranging still 30 to 50% on a lot of these trials. And of course, now there are a lot more trials that are kind of still ongoing. I think historically it's been difficult to do sort of randomized trials for, uh, for cardiogenic shock because it's hard to randomize somebody who's crashing before you to say we're only going to do medical treatment or something that you feel is an inferior choice versus go for VA ECMO, go the whole nine yards. So I think that has been a big barrier to doing randomized controlled trials. Now kind of getting to VA ECMO, which was uh, to be the, the heart of this talk, peripheral VA ECMO is a right atrial to femoral circulatory support, which to which we add an oxygenator. It does provide biventricular support because it directly siphons blood out of the right side from the right atrium. The equipment required typically is going to be a 17 to 19, but in rare circumstances, we can also go up to a 21 front arterial cannula. All depends on how big the femoral artery is to see how much we can accommodate. But it's important to remember that our flow is, is directly related to our cross-sectional area of that cannula times the velocity of the flow going through, uh, velocity of the blood going through it. So essentially, if we have a fixed velocity, our cross-sectional area is gonna matter a lot. So in a person who really needs it, the support, if they have small vessels, it's not really doing them a big service if we're going to be in, ending up putting a 15 French cannula because we'll never be able to generate the flow that they require. And then of the venous cannulas, it's 21 to 25 French. So common VA ECMO indications, uh, of course, refractory cardiogenic shock in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, acute heart failure, postcardio Cardiotomy is another instance. Uh, usually those patients are already on cardiopulmonary bypass in the OR, but sometimes they cannot be weaned off, in which case they're either transitioned to a central VA ECMO and then later to peripheral VA ECMO, depending on how long they need the support for. Myocarditis, of course, these both postcardiotomy and myocarditis tend to be biventricular processes, hence they need VA ECMO support if uh, refractory to medications. Primary graft failure after heart transplantation, um, refractory ventricular arrhythmias, and uh, in severe cases of infection, drug intoxication, and severe hypothermia. There are some, of course, contraindications too that are worth uh, mentioning. You know, if somebody's life expectancy is not long because of other comorbid uh, conditions, then VA ECMO is not a good idea, specifically a disseminated malignancy. If it was an unwitnessed cardiac arrest, typically this would not be offered uh, just because the likelihood of them coming out of it prolonged uh, being down, uh, the neurologic consequences of that, many of which cannot be directly assessed right when they hit the door with EMS, um, would make them probably a poor candidate. Um, and definitely uh, severe aortic insufficiency is really a contraindication for many of these devices, which are going to be increasing afterload. So many of these devices that are going to give you retrograde uh, blood flow, uh, it's not going to be a good idea because it's just going to worsen your aortic regurgitation. And then, of course, if they have severe peripheral arterial disease, it just cannot accommodate the size of these cannulas. Relative contraindications, of course, are advanced age and uh, bleeding diathesis because they are going to end up needing a lot of anticoagulation because of the hemocompatibility issues with the pumps. And then outcomes of VA ECMOs, again, uh, if you look at this, um, this was a compilation of many uh, papers um, that are out there in Jack Heart failure. And basically, it's looking at what were the outcomes of VA ECMO, whether it was done for post-cardiotomy versus post-transplantation versus just cardiogenic shock, myocarditis, or cardiac arrest. And you can see there's a wide mortality range, but in a lot of them, the mortality average is still very high on the order of 50 to 60 percent. Partly, you can say also because if somebody ventured to put in a VA ECMO, it was probably definitely because this patient was just that sick.
So how can we distinguish, are there, are there scores out there that can sort of help us restratify and see, does this patient even have a shot? Is it worth pursuing? And there are some out there, uh, some that are mentioned in the ELSO registry, for example, this one is the SAVE score. And it takes into account a lot of things, uh, one of them being diagnosis, uh, what initially led to the shock in the first place. Uh, myocarditis fares a lot better than, for example, congenital heart disease, which would generate negative five points. Age, of course, the, the older somebody is, the worse off they are. So it helps to be younger, uh, as would be expected. Kind of being mid-range with weight is better than being on either end of the spectrum. And of course, if somebody has other uh, comorbid features, they already have shock liver, they already have renal failure, these do not bode well. So when we take all of these into account, in addition to how much, how long they've been intubated, et cetera, we can generate a safe score. And just in general, the higher the score, the more positive the score, uh, the higher the chances of survival and probably more justification for proceeding with something like a VA ECMO. Now, in general, if we're talking about using this in refractory cardiogenic shock, Obviously, then we would say that the VA ECMO does have some beneficial aspects to the heart. And those include things like increasing the central aortic pressure. It is delivering the blood through the femoral arterial cannula, the outflow graft essentially, in a retrograde fashion. And so that is helping us increase the central aortic pressure, thereby helping us perfuse the rest of the body. It does help uh, with coronary perfusion to some extent by doing so. And then it would help with normalization of the blood oxygen content and hence improve myocardial oxygen delivery because it's got the oxygenator there. And finally, by us being able to manipulate things like the sweep, it helps us normalize the acid base and other metabolic abnormalities such as the lactate just by helping us perfuse better. And of course, as you know, we can also dialyze through the circuit. But there's a price to pay for just trying to achieve a higher systemic perfusion. And here we can see in just a uh, sort of a pressure volume loop, you can see that um, the total work that is being done by the heart is linearly correlated with the pressure volume area. And that comprises of the stroke work that is in the blue area plus the potential energy. And there is a flow dependent increase in end diastolic pressure as you can see in the graph to the right where we can see um, at baseline is the blue circle, baseline cardiogenic shock. And as you go up with the ECMO flow, yes, you are achieving higher blood pressures, as you can see, the peak pressures are getting higher, but at the cost of it, your diastolic performance is getting worse and your EDP, which is your end diastolic pressure inside the left ventricle is getting worse. And it's getting worse also by the fact that as you go up higher on and higher on the pressures, on the flows from the ECMO, which is going retrograde against an already weak heart, it can lead to a point where your aortic valve is no longer opening. So you've lost pulsatility. And that combination of things, uh, the increased effective arterial elastins, as well as just the backflow against a weak heart, making it harder for the heart to pump against, eventually leads to higher intracardiac filling pressures and also decreased stroke volume. The stroke volume here you can see is the difference between the furthest out, out point, the rightmost line of each of these PV loops minus the leftmost line. So that is your um, stroke volume. It's the EDV or end diastolic volume minus your end systolic volume. So then the question becomes, do you unload or not? And this is something that is being studied more. And I think it's sort of become common practice at a lot of places where if somebody had a weak heart going into this and they've gotten VA ECMO and they're needing a lot of flows and they've become non-pulsatile that you just, from the get-go, you put in an LV vent. When we're doing everything percutaneously, we would use something like an impella for this, an impella CP as you can see in the picture to the right. But of course, if this is a central VA ECMO, uh, then it's uh, usually done already where there's a direct LV vent or something that's going in from say the right upper pulmonary vein, which is essentially achieving the same thing. And the benefits of LV unloading, again, going to these PV loops, which you've studied, you can see the differences. When you take the normal physiology, looking at the left of the screen, which is the circle in the red, then we have a rightward 
a shift of the curve with decrease in our stroke volume when you have systolic left heart failure. And then when you add a VA ECMO to that, you have improvements in the blood pressure as we expect, but you have a decrement in the uh, stroke volume and you have more um, actually uh, cardiac work being done. And this can be mitigated if you look to the right with use of a left ventricular venting where you can really start shifting that curve back to the left closer towards normalcy. And the best of those is achieved with use of an impella. And I wanted to make a distinction here between cardiopulmonary bypass, which you all do uh, probably even more than you uh, help with the pulmonary, uh, sorry, with the peripheral via ECMO cannulations. The idea is very similar. However, there are a couple differences. With the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, there is a venous reservoir. So a big chunk of the blood is actually sitting outside of the body. And that predictably would create more uh, hematocompatibility issues, potentially need for a lot more or anticoagulation. Um, and in general, those patients are already under hypothermia, which is not a requirement for peripheral VA ECMO. And in peripheral VA ECMO, we do not have a reservoir outside of the body where the blood is sitting. And furthermore, if you keep comparing the two, cardiopulmonary bypass hopefully is not required for any longer than a few hours. Peripheral VA ECMO is kept for days uh, hopefully not for weeks, but it, it has been used that long. The advantage of cardiopulmonary bypass or central VA ECMO is that you can use much larger cannulas. So going back to the idea that cross-sectional area matters and how much flow you can generate, it helps to be able to use bigger cannulas, which we are limited peripherally because we can only, as interventionalists, can only access the femoral arterial artery. And here's the central VA ECMO. Another very big distinction between cardiopulmonary by bypass, and I will lump that with central VA ECMO versus the peripheral VA ECMO, which we would do, is that the directionality of the flow is different. The outflow graph that comes out of a central VA ECMO is going to shoot blood in the native or anti-grade fashion. So it's not competing with the heart's own flow. This is very different from peripheral VA ECMO where a femoral cannula is shooting blood against the heart, increasing the afterload for the heart to work against. So here we discuss this, of course, with central VA ECMO, the big uh, disadvantage is that it must be surgically placed with the sternotomy and therefore it cannot be done emergently outside of the OR. So the usual situation in which this happens is um, when the patient is already in the OR and some, uh, something has happened. So now going back to it, what are the hemodynamic pitfalls of peripheral VA ECMO? We discussed several of these, but a big one also has to do with the fact that the directionality of the flow is different from uh, how the body normally behaves. So um, the LV is also not totally unloaded, even though we are trying to unload the right side of the heart and therefore that's unloading the rest of the heart, it's not taking out all of the blood because the left side still gets blood directly from pulmonary and bronchial circulation. The retrograde flow, again, increases afterload to the LV. This may lead to LV distension, increasing the wall stress, further increasing the LV EDP, further reducing the coronary flow, which is the difference between your diastolic systemic pressure minus your LV EDP, and therefore worsening your pulmonary edema and hypoxemia because everything is just backing up. This leads to LV distension, and these are the major issues. So one issue that is very unique um, for those of you who might not deal with the peripheral VA ECMOs as much as you do the central ones, this one is unique to peripheral. This is called North-South syndrome or Harlequin syndrome, and it's named so because it causes differential hypoxemia. So it's as if the right arm, for instance, which would get blood flow from the aorta earlier than the left side, would be a different color almost. That would be blue or cyanotic compared to the left side of the body, which would be more responsive and more receptive to the blood coming directly post-oxygenator from the VA ECMO circuit. And that's why it's called Harlequin syndrome because of the outfits that the Harlequins used to wear. 
And here in this picture, you can see that where the white contrasted blood is only coming to a point in the aortic arch. And so it's possible that the right carotid is not getting the fully oxygenated blood from the oxygenator. Um, it's instead seeing the blood more directly from the heart, which is ejecting partially deoxygenated blood because the lungs are wet, so they're not able to do the appropriate gas exchanges. And this is the reason why post-peripheral VACMO, we usually put a right-sided uh, radial arterial line, and that's where we get all of our ABGs for monitoring from, because it's a surrogate for what essentially the brain is seeing. And the solutions, of course, if we're having terrible north-south syndrome is to increase the pump flow so that the oxygenated cloud or the mixing cloud is pushed closer and closer to the aortic root. So all of the carotids and great, great vessels uh, get the uh, super oxygenated blood. We can also diurese um, improve uh, the vent settings to improve the lung mechanics so that what little blood is ejected by the heart is has improved oxygenation. And when all of these things fail, there are other things we can do with the circuitry by being able to add certain limbs by making it a veno arteriovenous system where the arterial or outflow cannula is Y connected to uh, another return venous cannula to improve more oxygenated blood returning to the venous system itself pre-lung. So after discussion of that, of course, you know, we discussed that we want to evaluate a patient with their hemodynamics as best as we can to determine if they need biventricular support before venturing onto something like VA ECMO. But there are situations, again, where we are seeing a crashing patient and we do not have the luxury of time to do that. And a classic example of that is eCPR, where essentially this VA ECMO is being placed in a patient who is actively coding. Um, that, of course, you can imagine increases the risks associated with cannulation significantly. Um, but there are other places, not so much in our med center necessarily, but there are other countries, for example, that do quite a bit of eCPR. But here again, timing is key. Of course, if somebody is beyond 20 minutes of refractory arrest, the chance of survival with just standard CPR becomes less than 5%. So these are the patients that we're talking about. And it's it's tricky doing eCPR because you don't want to intervene and place the pump in too early, because if you do it too early without giving them about you know, 10, 15 minutes of good CPR, it might be that ROSC could have been achieved with CCPR alone, in which case you've subjected them to the morbidity associated with cannulation um, without uh, necessarily a need for it or it could be too late if you're deliberating and deliberating and haven't made the decision because you didn't have all the information available to you. By the time you decide to put it in 30, 45 minutes later, that's time that the brain was underperfused and you might have irreversible organ damage. So when we're talking about the bridge to a decision or bridge to recovery, that opportunity is lost. So you know, in general, examples of inclusion criteria for eCPR would be age less than 70, a witness arrest presumably would have started the CPR process almost immediately, so would have better chance. Arrest to the first CPR should be less than five minutes. Initial cardiac rhythms of either VT, VF, or PEA, and uh, some sign of life would of course be a uh, positive predictor if you saw the patient grimace or something like that. Um, those would be supportive. Um, again, quick cannulation, it can be unilateral or bilateral. A lot of times we're doing these at bedside. Um, so uh, rather than deliberating on which side, of course, if you have more operators, then it would be faster to get access on both and go from there. At no point should ACLS be interrupted while the cannulation is being done, um, if possible. Um, ideally, you would want to use fluoro, but of course, if you're doing it at bedside, that is not something that we have access to. Ultrasound would be a good second, if just to see the wire, since all of these things are being done um, over stiff wires. And then, of course, when you're about to turn on the pump, that's when even if ACLS calls for it at that point, you might want to hold the epinephrine push, because as soon as you turn on the ECMO, the blood pressure is going to go quite high. 
And then of course you want to gradually increase the flow uh, to about three to four liters over 20 second period and stop CPR once you're over three liters because you've already provided decent uh, perfusion at that point. With peripheral VA ECMOs, a uh, situation that we deal with more than with central is mitigation of limb ischemia. Because these cannulas can be 17 to 21 French, a uh, French is a third of a millimeter. So if you multiply that out, we're talking pretty large cannulas going in and they can be obstructive to the leg beyond. One thing that we try to do to mitigate this is we put a distal reperfusion catheter and that would be maybe a seven or eight French sheath that we put into the ipsilateral SFA, which we then connect to the side port of the outflow cannula of the VA ECMO, so that at least some of that blood will make it down the leg. But this is a common problem. It can affect even up to 30% of patients who end up being on VA ECMO. And here are some other, uh, other complications that are noted. Bleeding is, of course, the most common, even up to 30%. Uh, just because they're on blood thinners. Many of them by that point are coagulopathic. Thromboembolic complications are also there, though with the use of more biocompatible uh, materials and use of anticoagulation, we can mitigate that somehow, somewhat. But when we do see clots, it's more often microthromboemboli that we see in the oxygenator. And sometimes it gets to a point where that has to be changed. Fundamentally, we want to achieve a balance, of course, between hemostasis and thrombosis to avoid the neurological complications that can occur, as well as bleeding. Um, and finally, there's a risk of infection and vascular complications, which we discussed. Coming to the end, of course, we don't intend to keep any of these devices in forever. We always want to give a shot to a patient on a daily trial to see how much they can wean, what is their dependence. We don't just want to cruise control and leave them on three and a half liters for 10 days and not have tried to see if they're recovering at all. So there are both hemodynamic parameters. If you have a swan in place that we can assess with, as well as echocardiographic parameters, realizing that we can never fully assess the RV dependence or lack of dependence on the VA ECMO till it's completely clamped. Because even at a flow of 0.5, it's still siphoning some blood out of that RA and therefore providing some RV support. But essentially, once we do that, once the decision has been made, and you've tried maybe even with a momentary clamp that this patient should tolerate it, you will want to increase the flow back up to two and keep them there till they go to the OR for decannulation. And usually, if they had a vent in place, such as an impella, we will keep the impella for a couple more days to provide some ongoing support, uh, even cranking that up a little bit higher uh, while the VA ECMO is removed. Um, and finally, when we're talking about this, especially for a lot of these patients who are coming in, they have a history of heart failure, they have had recurrent decompensations, and they never really quite uh, recover from any of those back to their baseline. Here we can see we're talking about advanced heart failure patients. These are the patients who ultimately are never going to have enough uh, cardiac recovery, and we're talking about these percutaneous MCS as being bridges to something more definitive, such as a heart transplant, such as uh, uh, a left ventricular assist device, which is a durable mechanical circulatory support device, which is surgically implanted, or we're talking about palliative care. And just the final slide here is uh, with all of these percutaneous MCS really taking hold in a lot of hospital, large hospital systems, which use more of a hub and spoke model essentially to use their satellite hospitals to send them hopefully in a timely fashion, the patients who are still salvageable. Um, a lot of places are instituting shock teams. Um, Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Heart have also done the same since January. Um, so hopefully to facilitate this, if you see somebody who needs help, that would involve the uh, heart failure person on call, an interventionalist on call, as well as the pulmonary critical care doctor, and of course you. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask. Um, and I hope to be working with all of you at some point. Thank you.